This is the sixth lecture or sixth video in a class on single agent search. And in this lecture, we're going to be looking at the IDA star algorithm. In the next video, we'll be looking at some enhancements to IDA star. So we'll be looking at how you run it in parallel and how you um, combine it with a star. And then in the, <clears throat> so those are actually forming one lecture, but in, then in the video after that, We'll be looking at the worst case of IDA star, and we'll be looking at a new algorithm called budgeted tree search, which is a, a very good drop-in replacement for IDA star that is able to avoid that worst case. But for historical reasons, we're going to look at IDA star first, understand how it works, because that's also pedagogical reasons that's going to help us understand the budgeted algorithm we'll look at after that. Okay, so as I said, in this video, we're looking at IDA star. And what we saw previously is we, when we looked at uninformed search algorithms, we started with a breadth first search. Uh, we showed that breadth first search used a lot of memory. If we tried to reduce the memory, then we could use depth first search. But depth first search had other problems in that it often went too deep, or if there are multiple goals or other things like this. And so we replaced that with depth first iterative deepening. And depth first iterative deepening then for an uninformed search algorithm is optimal both in space and in time, given a few other assumptions. And so now what we want to do is we want to take a star, which just basically said, how do we introduce heuristics into a, a breadth first search or Dijkstra's algorithm or uniform cost search, whatever you want to call these. We're going to take a star and we're now going to convert this into IDA star. Now it's important to note that we aren't doing best first search anymore. So this notion of having an open list and things like that uh, are gonna go away. We're gonna go back to our depth first search, and, but, but we're gonna get some nice performance gains as a result. So IDA star is an algorithm from Rich Corf from 1985. And essentially it's gonna be depth first search deepening but instead of doing it within the, the limits of our edges, it's going to be depth first iterative deepening with F costs. Okay, so fairly, uh, should, hopefully should be fairly straightforward. So we can start to look at how we're going to do this and the actual the pseudocode for doing this isn't too bad. So let's go ahead and write that down. So what does IDA star look like? Okay, so it's going to be starting with a start and a goal. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with a limit. So the limit initially, that is how far do we want to search? Initially, the limit is going to be the F cost of the start state. Okay. So normally in depth pursuit of deepening, we would have just started with a depth of zero, but we're going to look at the F cost, F is G plus H as at any star here. And we're going to use that as our initial limit, as initial potential cost. And then we're going to do a little loop here. Basically, until we find a solution, we'll say the path is going to be getting the result of doing a, um, a, co a cost limited. This is F cost limited. From the start to the goal under some limit. And, um, and then we're going to assume that this procedure here, that when I say cost limited depth first search, it's actually going to compute the next limit for us. And so then we're just going to say uh, the limit is going to get whatever the new limit is coming from that search. And we're going to do this while we don't have a path. And then we just return the path. Now there's something important here. If no path actually exists, IDA star without, especially in this version, and as it's typically described, would sort of iterate forever, doing the exact same work over and over again in the full tree. Um, there's some things you can do here, for instance, if your new limit doesn't grow or other things like that, we could figure that out. But let's look at how this works in practice a little bit. And so, um, so a depth first search here, cost limited, basically, before we did a depth first search where we limited by the depth, now we're just gonna say limit by the F cost. So I'm not gonna draw the pseudocode for how that works there. But um, let's take a look at um, how this algorithm actually works and just look at it at a high level. 
Okay, so we have a start state here and we're gonna imagine we have some tree here that is uh, building out underneath here. And then we can continue to build that tree. I'm not gonna be precise here in this tree. The point is we have a bunch of nodes. And if we were to run a, um, if we were to run a, for instance, a, a breadth or sorry, a depth first search on this algorithm, then we'll make another copy here just to compare these. So here we have a depth, uh, a depth first set of deepening, and then we're going to look at IDA star. So if we run depth first set of deepening and we think about the layers that we're going to get in the tree, depth first set of deepening is going to do the first layer, and then it'll do the first and second, and then it'll do the first, second, and third, the first, second, third, and fourth, and then the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And because this last layer is um, always growing, each layer is growing by a constant factor over the previous layer, then we know the number of nodes at the bottom is large enough that it amortizes away the cost or that the cost of the previous iterations basically are not asymptotically enough to, to impact the asymptotic performance of the algorithm. Now, if we look at IDA star, just to write this a little bit clearer there, IDA star, what is IDA star doing? Well, you know, we could try to run in the same way through the tree. But the problem is, is that we might have something happen where we have some nodes in the tree, for instance, that are clearly given a heuristic, are clearly uninteresting. We should really never visit them. Maybe we know they're far, far from the goal, from this, yeah, from the goal. And so our tree should be more focused. So what we might be doing is we might be saying, well, I'm going to expand some portion of the tree here. And in the next iteration, of course, I have to do that next portion, but maybe I get to come down and do a little bit there and do a little bit um, extra here. Um, as I do another iteration, again, that iteration might be, um, might be more focused than the entire tree. And so you could imagine that there's some branches that our heuristic may be able to cut off and may, uh, for some amount of time. And then there's other branches that we'd more selectively go down the tree. Now, um, practically speaking then, looking at what's going on, what we expect here is that depth first of deepening is, is um, building these layers solely based on depth. But now we could imagine if I sort of were to draw the trees, I may have very non-uniform uh, trees that I actually get from level to level that you know could go quite deep and they all completely depend on the heuristic. And so what we, would, what we see here is that as we go into this tree, we have different F cost layers. So this might be F cost eight, this might be F cost of 10, of 12, of 14. Um, and depth first iterative deepening, because it's not looking at F cost, we wouldn't want it to sort of uniformly go through this tree. Okay, so IDA starts really thinking about, about these layers. And what we can do to illustrate this is actually we can run a demo here. So let's go ahead and look at a, a video of IDA star running. And so here, we're not going to write down the actual costs here, but this is a demo. And what we're gonna show is that the nodes that are highlighted, they're highlighted in blue at the top. Those are the nodes with one particular F cost. It doesn't really matter what it is. And then we have a blue layer, which is the next F cost, and then a red layer, which is the final F cost. And so what we're gonna see is we're gonna search the first set of nodes, and then we'll search, well, let's just watch it run. So we do the first set of nodes, and then we do the second set of nodes. You notice the search goes a little bit beyond each set of nodes before it then goes to the final set of nodes here where it's going to go ahead and find a solution. Okay, you can watch that one more time. So um, with each layer, we do a depth first search through that entire layer all at once. We go one node past the edge of that layer, and then we continue down to search the entire tree. Okay, so that's how IDA star works. And Given that that's how it works, what we can do is now try to analyze, seeing that picture, what is going on. Okay, so what we what we see here, the, the key question we want to look at is where are the F costs, at least initially, where do the F costs come from? And the idea is that IDA star, um, well, it's going to get its first F cost up here from the F cost of the start state. And then what we want to do is we want to do an iteration on each successive set of states with each new F cost. So what's gonna happen here is when I do a search in this tree, when, 
I, let's say that my limit is eight. I'm gonna definitely have to look at all the nodes with F cost of eight. And I'm gonna look to see, is there a goal inside the set of nodes that have an F cost of eight or whatever the first F cost is. But at the same time, I'm gonna go just a little bit beyond that border to say, what is the next largest F cost that I see as I traverse the tree? So the first F cost might be eight. Um, the next F cost could be a hundred, it could be it could be nine, it could be 8.5, it could really be anything. And the way I discover that is as I generate, expand in the nodes on the edge here and then generate their successors, I observe each time that I find a node that has an F cost that's higher than my current iteration. And then I take the minimum value for that F cost as the F cost for the next iteration. On uh, many sort of of our, of our toy problems that we play with, that works really well. You know, I go from eight and then I might find 10, then we might find 12, 14, and so on. And then we would go forward on there. But um, in, in some cases, they, this may not work and we'll analyze that in just a second. Okay, so if we think about this, um, let's assume that we have a consistent heuristic. And then we're going to ask the question, okay, is this um, optimal? And is it complete? And then we want to know what the time is to run and the space required. Okay. So the question is of, um, is it complete? Is it going to find a solution if one exists? And um, this is related to the optimal solution. So if I can show that it's optimal, then I'm going to show it's complete. And we can actually show that it is optimal. And there's a couple things we'll need to be able to look at this. There's some conditions. So one thing that we have is because, uh, because we know that the from the property of consistency, that path costs are going to be are going to be non-decreasing, given a consistent heuristic. And in fact, as I go along a path, we're gonna assume that we have no zero cost edges for simplicity here. Then we, what we would see is that the, along any given path that I go down the tree, then costs may stay, the, the F cost may stay the same for a while, but the G costs are always increasing. And, and so eventually what's going to happen is the path cost must increase. So any path cost going down the tree, as long as there's some minimum epsilon that is greater than zero, uh, right, because if we have, what we could have is we could have an edge of like one and then a half and then a quarter and then an eighth. So we could, if we don't have a minimum edge cost, we could have an infinite series of edges that have finite cost. So we, that would be a problem. We can't allow that. So um, for optimal incompleteness, what we're going to want is have a minimum edge cost. And uh, as long as we have a minimum edge cost and then we have a consistent heuristic, then we know along every path that the costs are strictly going to be increasing. The next thing that we know is that when we iterate over a set of nodes with a particular cost, then we'll explore everything with a given F cost before we increase the F cost bound. And that F cost bound must continue to increase as long as there's nodes that haven't been expanded yet. And therefore, in every iteration, there must be at least one new node with the new F, with the next F cost, because actually we see it in the previous iteration. Um, since there's no infinite length paths of finite cost, eventually we're going to expand longer and longer paths, at least one new node every time. And so in a finite number of iterations, we will find the goal. And so it will be complete. And optimality isn't much more difficult than getting completeness. We can just think about the frontier of nodes that we're getting to at each state. And that frontier of nodes, um, on the frontier of nodes that are generated, we always, sort of like A star is, we always have a node on the optimal path that's generated in each iteration. And so either we're going to generate, in the next iteration, either we generate that node again, or we're going to expand that node and generate a new node on the optimal path. And because our thresholds are increasing, we don't skip any thresholds. And the um, and and we increase them basically slowly as slowly as they actually increase. We look at every single iteration that the so for iterations go from low to high. Then when I find the goal on a particular iteration, then I guarantee that I actually have found the optimal path to that. 
And that's also because the, the paths are strictly, are, are monotonically increasing. Sorry, not strictly, but monotonically, they can stay the same or get longer. So I can never uh, find a, a path cost to a goal that's more expensive without exploring a, le a less expensive path first. Okay, this is a bit hand wavy here, but um, from this is follows sort of from the same principles as the A star proofs. And uh, so hopefully this isn't too difficult to understand here. So the important thing is we can never run with a threshold that's larger than the cost of the goal, because I know that there is this, we're always generating the a portion of the optimal path. And therefore I would always, if, if I find the goal, I'll always run it with a duration with that cost and I'll never, never run with a cost above that. Okay. So that gives us a, an optimality or a sketch of optimality and completeness. Now we want to think about the time and the space. And so for the moment, let's assume that we have a branching factor B of B and the solution cost. Now I'm going to call the solution cost D for simplicity here. Really, the solution is C star, uh, but we're going to call it D just because this is sort of the standard notation. So how much time does it require? So this is a little bit funny, right? Because what's going on here is before our tree grew exactly with a branching factor of B. And now as I've sort of illustrated in this picture here, we get these sort of very non-uniform uh, portions of the tree that we search. And so we're gonna have to move into an abstract model here to be able to talk about what's going on. But let's just assume that B, the branching factor B, is the branching factor assuming the heuristic. Okay, so that's, or we could call it the heuristic branching factor. Let me just write that. Okay, if the heuristic branching factor is B, so that's how fast the state space grows, even when we take the heuristic pruning into account. And in a later lecture, we'll talk about where this information comes from and how we can compute something like the branching factor, given, you know, given some of the pruning that we might be able to do in a state space. But if we assume that here's the branching factors B, so we're thinking about, you know, from this iteration to this iteration, the search grows by a factor of B, then what we would see is, well, you know, we're going to do um, B nodes at an iteration, and we're going to do approximately, uh, well, there's going to be the, the cost of the greatest iteration. So this is, is, you know, again, there's some constants here that we might be dividing by, um, but it's going to be something like B to the D, so O of B to the D. Okay, so for instance, if I have, if for instance, I assume that all my cost edges have cost one, then this works out really easily. If all my edges have cost a half, then I just have to multiply my D uh, times two. And so, you know, there's some constant factors there that we might work out. Uh, and again, with the minimum edge cost of epsilon, then this is like, again, if it's C star, we could say that D is equal to C star over epsilon. So this is really, um, it's looking at the cost in terms of the depth of the number of layers that I'm doing in the tree. And the amount of space that I have, well, I only keep one branch in the tree at a time. And so the space is going to be that, um, the depth that I have to go. Okay. So this looks really good, right? We've got, um, we've, we've got sort of our equivalent. We've put a heuristic in the time. We know we can't avoid that time because we've got to look at all the nodes and the space is O of D. And so that's sort of minimal because that's the log of the amount of time. And so IDA star looks like it's a pretty good algorithm. But, um, but we want to think about here, what is the cost of, what is the total cost here in, in, without this assumption? So here we assume this branching, a heuristic branching factor of D, what is the worst case? And in the worst case, now that we're not actually using the tree directly, we could imagine in the worst case that every node in our tree has a unique F cost. So we could assume if we have every unique F cost, every time we're going to add not a factor of B nodes, but we're going to add actually just one node to the search. So our iterations, instead of being 1 plus B plus B squared, would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus in the end, what I get to is b to the d nodes at the end. Again, I'm, I'm abusing a little bit the b to the d here. Um, you know, if I'm talking about iterations or things like this, 
but um, hopefully we can just bear with that a little bit of abuse there. And the question is what happens if I do one plus two plus three all the way up to b to the d? And so we know the general form of one plus all the way up to n um, is equal to O of n squared. And so when I go one to b to the d, then I'm actually gonna hit b to the d squared. So this is going to be approximately b to the 2d. Okay, and this is really important because now I've taken a problem that maybe I thought I had to search 10, now I have to search depth 20. It's equivalent of, you know, the number of nodes would be the same as searching depth 20. And that's going to be a lot more overhead than actually sort of a, the small factor of overhead we get with an exponential domain. Okay, so IDA star has a really bad worst case performance. and then there's some there's some other things here, but let's look at what happens in the worst case performance of IDA star. So I have a little video here, and actually I'm going to provide links in the description below. Should have links to these demos that allow you to see and run and see what happens here. So let's go to this demo here, and let's just watch what happens. If not every uh, we're not don't have every node with a unique f cost here, but there's uh, most nodes have different f costs. And so here, actually, we're going to run really, really quickly because what you can see here is the tree is growing is growing very, very slowly. There's one or two nodes being added in each iteration. And so this gives us a sense of what a real problem is with IDA star if we get into the case where we don't have an exponential growth of the tree, uh, of the costs in the tree. Okay. In fact, you can see here, like the IDA star before finished very, very quickly, and now it's running much faster, but it's still going to take quite a, a bit longer to, to finish, even though this is on the same, the overall tree has the same structure. And even though it looks like we're getting really close to the end, we see, you know, we only add one node here. Now, there's one other thing you might be observing in the tree, which is there's these links that are going horizontally or almost horizontally across the tree. And this is another problem with IDA star. So A star is searching a graph and it is finding duplicates in the graph. And so therefore it searches every node exactly once. IDA star searches a tree and it doesn't do duplicate detection. So although in this demo I've drawn the duplicates here and connected them together and in theory we could be detecting them, in practice when we run IDA star we would run out of memory when trying to do that. And so we don't always actually detect those duplicates. So we've got these cross links here that are, um, that are that could be causing problems and could cause a large overhead. And I'll show an example of that in a second. So, okay, IDA star finally found the result here. We see in practice, IDA star could form very poorly if we do not have uniform this, this uniform growth of the tree uh, in the heuristic costs. Okay, so let me show you one more thing that's a worst case here. So imagine if my tree, uh, I'm going to draw this, actually I'm going to keep this here. So let's imagine that my tree, I'm going to make a very simple tree here, but instead of having actual tree growing out, we could imagine that I just have two edges to the next node here. Okay, so if I don't do duplicate detection on this tree, then what happens? Well, I'm going to search the left branch and I'll come down here, the entire left branch and then the right branch. And then I would come up and I would continue to search the left and the right and then the left and the right. And basically this tree by IDA star would be expanded into a full binary tree. Okay, coming out this way. So IDA star would see this as this full entire tree here where A star would immediately see that these nodes here are duplicates and therefore we only have to generate them once and we don't have to generate their children multiple times. Okay, so this is another problem with IDA star is if we have many cycles or transpositions in the state space, then we might end up re-expanding nodes and that would be an exp exponential overhead. So essentially here, we've taken what should be a branching factor of one and we've turned it into a branching factor of two. And that could be very detrimental to the performance of, of IDA star. Okay, and the, um, so the types of problems we're going to want to run IDA star on are problems that don't have a lot of cycles, or if we do have cycles, we're going to have to invest extra overhead in trying to avoid, avoid those cycles. And so if you uh, look at a problem like the Rubik's Cube, 
It ends up that in Rubik's Cube, we have some methods. Again, we'll look at them later in the class where we can avoid almost all cycles within the Rubik's Cube or uh, transpositions, you know, two paths that get us to the same state. It's fairly easily easy to avoid most of those. And in something like the sliding tile puzzle, actually there's, there's many, many transpositions. Actually, the video that I was showing you here is from the sliding tile puzzle. And so we pay a fairly large overhead. And so in the next video, we're gonna look at one of the ways we can avoid those overheads by combining A star and IDA star. And, and we'll also, as I said, look at, also look at how we can run IDA star in parallel, which is using a very, very similar idea, which is why we're gonna group those together. But anyway, so this gives us a view of IDA star and the key points of IDA star is that it is basically the depth first iter deepening equivalent of, of A star in a, uh, in a heuristic search. And what we're doing is we're just doing a bunch of depth first searches, but instead of limiting by the depth, we're going to limit by the F cost. We use the F cost, the, ne the lar next largest F cost seen in one layer to be the F cost of the next layer. This gives an algorithm that is optimal and complete. And on very simple problems or problems where we have, um, where we have a branching factor, the heuristic branching factor grows, of, like, grows exponentially. So we get a, a constant branching factor that causes the tree to grow exponentially. Then we get something like B to the D behavior as we saw in depth first iterative deepening. But in the worst case, we're gonna get much worse than that because we're gonna get basically the square behavior from re-expansions of nodes over and over again. And so we'll look in two videos from now how we're able to avoid that problem. Okay, so this completes this lecture and we will continue from here looking at more variants next.